Hi, my name is Siros and I'm the host of the PAN podcast. Welcome. For this conversation, I had the great pleasure to speak to Dr. John Allman. John is a general practitioner who on a regular basis uses lifestyle and nutrition interventions to help his patients improve their health and combat their diseases. John is also a co-founder of Plant-Based Doctors Ireland and he's an expert on planetary health. In our conversation, we talked about how John very effectively uses nutrition interventions to help his patients and how health professionals can support planetary health. Now, um, I really enjoyed talking to John and I wish you a very good time listening to him and listening to our conversation. And without further ado, I bring to you Dr. John Allman. Well, it's really a pleasure uh, to have you here. Your, uh, your talk at uh, Nutrition Greater Medicine was, was awesome. Uh, we received so much good feedback for that. And I'm, I'm very happy to talk to you. And I think you have so many um, really valuable things to share and so many things that are beneficial for um, you know, medical students, medical doctors, all health professionals, in my opinion, uh, and really the planet as well. And, and we're gonna get into that. Um, so a big thank you um, that, for, for being here. Thank you, John. The, the pleasure is all mine. So it's really nice to have the opportunity to chat about what I do all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and that's really, I mean, that's really cool as well. You're doing this all the time, right? You're a general practitioner in, in, in Dublin. So I really want to get, and this is interesting because you're a general practitioner and you, on a regular basis, you use lifestyle medicine and, and nutrition with your patients, which, um, you know, it's in the guidelines. We, we know that we should be doing this, but unfortunately, few people are doing it, I am, which I understand. You know, we don't learn in medical school. It's, it's rarely taught, but then there are sometimes these, you know, these, the, 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 the odd doctors such as yourself who are able to do it and who are able to, to practice it as well. Um, so I'd be really interested in how you got into this. Why, are you, why do you use nutrition in your medical practice as a general practitioner and how did you get interested uh, in the topic? Yeah, well, it's an interesting question in that we all, we all have our journey. And I suppose uh, my journey would be probably at two levels. There's one that's sort of your personal level and there's your professional level. And it probably needs to come from a personal level first. Mm. So I've, I, I love food. I've always loved food. And, and I'm probably blessed that uh, growing up, my mother would have been probably very good with sort of certain standards at home. We would have always had wholemeal spaghetti. We'd have had no access to sugar. So we were always cooking. Mm. So as a teenager, as a kid, I was able to make chocolate cakes and pavlovas and sponges because it was the only access to sweet stuff and interestingly when I became a doctor the first thing I did when I started earning was chocolate bars and coca-cola every day because mum wasn't watching and I could do what I liked and I was surprised that that was so strong in me but the lovely thing with the way I was brought up was probably my comfort food was still brown bread and soup and wholemeal. So I still had that background, which I could turn to, but the inclination was to go for the quick, fast, easy stuff. And probably the change was, I did several years in medicine and went up to sort of registrar level in the hospital and was gonna be a super duper consultant in cardiology or respiratory or one of those. And then I saw the light and I said, I'm going to end up fighting for a job, maybe ending up in some peripheral hospital for the rest of my life. How could I end up working where I want to work? Mm. And I thought general practice would suit that. I can choose where I want to work, mm. live in a community, get to know a community. And I made a switch. And part of that switch was I said, I'm going to take a year out. Mm -hmm. And that year out was a world trip. And I'd gone from a year of research in biggest hospital in Ireland, really high powered. I was on the conveyor belt. I was going to be a specialist to traveling with my girlfriend who became my wife and started to open my mind. Four months in India, yoga course, intensive 30 day meditation courses, started looking into Ayurvedic medicine. I think I bought 30 books in Ayurvedic medicine and posted them all home. Mm -hmm. uh, we did Thai massage courses and I became aware of, wow, the power of touch. The, the way people eat differently around the world. There, there's some cultures that depend on corn and others that depend on rice and others that depend on pulses. And 
there isn't one way of eating, there's loads of ways of eating. And at this time, I probably was, was probably into the damage from food, the pesticides, the insecticides. And I was thinking, wow, where does our food come from? And after that trip, I remember coming home and saying, I want to know where my tomatoes come from. I'm going to visit the farm. I want to make sure that I see the chain. So I've become really interested in food and really interested in something broader than clinical medicine, which was all these traditional therapies that had worked for thousands of years. And when I came home, I can remember uh, uh, moving in with some friends and there was a book left on the sofa and it was Fast Food Nation. Mm-hmm. And Fast Food Nation, I just flicked through it, but was amazed at this whole world of McDonald's and that there was a whole industry around tastes and chemistry that they could make in a test tube the, the taste of a bacon cheeseburger. And I thought, wow, maybe what I'm eating isn't even food. Mm. They're able to bypass our whole sense of food and tell us what we're eating. So I said, Jesus, I need to know more about this. I need to learn about food. So I went to the local library in Dublin. Uh, and this is, this is almost 20 years ago. And I took two books off the shelf. One of them was Food Revolution by John Robbins. Okay. And looking in that, the first few pages was about heart disease can be reversed by diet. Mm. I was like, what? I never heard of that. Mm. And, and that shocked me that it, I managed to go that far in medicine. I was doing cardiology registrar on call in the hospital. I never heard about a dietary change that could help heart disease. So that stuck with me. And then the second book, I took off the shelf was Food Politics by Marian Nessel, professor of nutrition, Cornell University. And that was running through how the first food guidelines in the US were being manipulated by the food industry. And I thought, wow, we can have the information, but people can manipulate your information so you hear what they want you to hear. So that started me on a course of, oh, wow, there is certain ways of eating that can reverse disease that I didn't know of. But what was interesting was I kept that information in my back pocket. This was just for me. It wasn't for my patients. Only only the extreme patient would I suggest it because at the time I was probably moving towards sort of vegetarian for ethical reasons and ethics shouldn't interfere with the consultation. So I shouldn't be imposing my ethics on a patient. Mm -hmm. The same way that if I saw a study that said that fundamental Sikhism or fundamental Islam, Mm -hmm. if the study said that makes you live a long, healthy life, a lot of people is uncomfortable. So I probably am not gonna push that on my patients. So the ethics made me say, oh, I'm not sure if I should do this because I'm biased because I'm ethically vegetarian. So I found myself rarely using with patients, but becoming more and more conscious of how I was eating. Mm -hmm. And then it so happened that I was living in the UK and a friend of mine said there was a doctor coming to speak. This is 2007 Mm -hmm. in the local, about 300 yards down the road in the local uh, tech, university tech. And it was Michael Greger. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. So he came to speak. And I was amazed. The association of what I was into at the time was organic and insecticides and certain foods having much higher levels of pollutants. And I just had my second child and I went, oh, my God, I want my child to have the best nutrition. So that pushed me into saying, wow, the higher up in the food chain, the more concentration of chemicals. I don't want that for my kid. And then at the same time, I changed practice I was working in. So I was working in a new practice. And in the UK, they have these things called patient participation groups. So you have representatives from the community who come along and say, well, we'd like you to do a talk, Dr. Allman, because you're the new doctor. What would you like to talk about? And I said, motivated by Gregor's talk, I said, I'd like to talk about how to eat optimally for health. Mm -hmm. So this got me presenting information on nutrition to... The, uh, the patients, but 100 people turned up and I gave a chat and really good feedback. 
So then you get onto a sort of talk circuit and you got invited to the local horticultural club. The, the local, the local uh, vegetable shop had a little sign saying, eat your kale as recommended by Dr. Allman. So I started getting a little bit of a reputation. Cool, yeah. But this was more at a personal level. Mm. So this was me personally seeing the information, adding it up and going, I want to eat better to decrease the amount of insecticides in my diet, mm. but probably starting to get into optimizing nutrition. And the next step was I came back to Ireland and the doctor who was in the practice that I'd attended to as a baby mm. was still working. Mm. And he got into the China study mm -hmm. and he started giving out the China study book to his patients. So there was a whole lot of people where I was brought up who were now eating totally different because the GP with his charisma was saying, he didn't even give them any resources. He'd just say, go and buy the China study. Mm. And people would just change their diet. Mm. And he was using it for cancer. Mm. And I started in that practice and thought, I better read up about the China study because this is what he's doing. So I read the China study and that sort of made me say, wow, there's a lot more to nutrition. Still at a personal level. Mm. And then uh, a few years later, Two things happened. Dr. Kelly wrote a book, Stop Feeding Your Cancer, which was documenting all his cases that he'd seen over the years of improvement with nutrition, case studies from his practice. Mm -hmm. And then he retired. So he wrote the book as he retired. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, my wife developed breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And when she developed breast cancer, our lives stopped. So his book, My Wife's Cancer, we went whole food plant-based overnight. Okay. And not just overnight, we, like, we didn't just go whole food plant-based, we removed any refined products, we were into sprouting organic broccoli seeds, we were juicing, we were doing everything. And my three kids, who would have been, I don't know, four, seven, and nine, they went whole food plant-based overnight as well. There was no choice. This is what we do. And that was at a personal level, through that pressure, we said, this is what we do. We don't care what anyone says. This is what we do. The issue with John Kelly bringing up the book was, this book was out in the public. There was articles in the newspaper. He interviewed on the radio and they all wanted to see him, but he was retired. So who's going to talk to them? So it came to me. So here I am. This is what I'm practicing. But I'm obliged to preach it because they're looking for Dr. Kelly, who's not here anymore. So they're coming in and I'm having these half hour consultations, which were just brilliant because people are coming in going, tell us what I can do to improve my diet, okay. which is a lovely consultation because they're asking you for the information. Mm. It's a different story when you're given it and they're not ready. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoyed that. And then I thought, I better learn more. So then I did the E Cornell Certificate in Plant-Based Nutrition. And then because I love learning, I was reading books. And then I did the Winchester University on Plant-Based Nutrition. I just keep learning. Mm -hmm. So it was that sort of process where in me, it became a personal story. And then it became a professional story mm -hmm. by default. Mm -hmm. And then it's become so normal that it's just part of what we use in terms of the mechanisms for treatment. Yeah. Uh, uh, John, thanks, thanks so much for sharing, for sharing your story about how you, how you got there, what got you interested in what, what, I mean, that's super interesting to, well, first of all, how, how's your wife now? Is, she goes, she goes. <laughs> that's good to hear, that's good to hear. So how, um, I mean, this is, this is really rare that the, the doctor that was in your practice before you, that this is, this is John Kelly, right? The doctor that you, that you talked about, that's his name. So he used nutrition as, as medical treatment way before the whole, you know, this whole plant-based movement really started. So he was one of the really early adapters of, of this, of this diet. And I mean, this is really rare that you, that you meet someone like this. He was your doctor when you were a child. And now you're in his practice, you took over the practice, now this is your practice, and you're, you're sort of um, 
um, you know, uh, carrying on his legacy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, this is this is a really, really, um, this is really cool to hear. This this is an mm -hmm. awesome, an awesome background that you have there. Yeah, cool. And so, and it's probably it, it, what was interesting was, I remember maybe 2016, trying to find plant-based doctors. There was none in Ireland. There was none in the UK. You couldn't mm -hmm. find them online. Mm -hmm. There was there wasn't really the term was nearly new. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's so different now. And it's amazing how this sort of wave has been cresting and it's sort of more and more popular uh, mm -hmm. that now I'm amazed that I have patients who come into me and they say, by the way, I'm whole food plant-based. And I didn't know, and they didn't know I was whole food plant-based. And this is just sort of blossoming. It's sort of mushrooming all over the place. But somebody, I think I must've put myself on plantbaseddoctors.org or something. And uh, people started to, doctors or dietitians started looking me up mm. just a handful mm. and we got together as plant-based doctors ireland mm. as a group to just to share ideas mm. uh, and it was so exciting to sort of have a tribe where you're sort of sharing this information with others but mm. starting very organically and very sort of very gently and slowly yeah yeah and i, and I really want to talk about plant-based plant-based doctors ireland as well but first let's let's talk about the um, how you implement nutrition in your practice, because uh, as I've already said, we had this really great feedback from your talk at, at our Nutrition Greater Medicine uh, event that, that you gave at, at, at PANS event. Um, and so I really want to go through the steps, like a patient comes into your office and you may be thinking, okay, this, this patient could benefit from nutritional advice. I mean, most often it's pretty much every patient could benefit from, from, uh, from nutritional advice, but what goes through your head and what specific uh, steps do you take to uh, to help them change their diet or to su support them in that? Because I know you have a very specific way to go about this, which I think is very, very empowering and, and super helpful. Okay. So I, I suppose when I talk about this, I usually talk about the motivation of the doctor, but I'm already motivated. But so you, you need the doctor to be motivated and you need them to say that this is what they want to do and it needs to be the role of the doctor. And any doctor that's motivated about anything can link conditions to the patient's complaint. Mm. So if I think of smoking, when a patient comes in, I can link smoking to loads of things. Do you know what I mean? Do, I know, do you know the way you've got a sore foot? Do you know that smoking delays healing? So I can link it. Mm. So it's having the motivation to change things. I, I keep getting recurrent uh, throat infections. Do you know that smoking delay, in, impairs your immune system? So we can do this anyway. If your motivation is to stop people smoking, you can link it to their condition. Mm. So the same way with nutrition, you need to link it to their symptom, to their concern, mm. to their risk. So when they turn up, their interest is the issue that they want to discuss. Mm. Okay. And in behavior change or in the consultation, you call them teachable moments. So someone comes in and the teachable moment is, I'm worried about X. And if you can make X linked to something nutritional, they're listening. Mm -hmm. It's very different to the person who forces it down their throat yeah. saying, do you know what? You need to become vegan. And I know you've come in with your sprained foot, but you need to be vegan because it's good for the planet and it's good for blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. That's irritating. So you need to say that the patient's interest is their issue. And once you've got their issue linked to nutrition, you make it alive. Mm. And I suppose the issue that we really need to think is, for most people, food is not important. It's calories. It's just give me something quick, satisfy my hunger. So you need to make food important. Their choice is important. Mm. So usually what I'll do is I will link it to their symptom so that it now has become important. And I'll do two things. I'll often do, based on what we're trying to achieve globally, which is we need to decrease the consumption of refined processed foods and animal products and increase our plants. So that's a general taken. So in terms of that, I need a piece of information mm -hmm. that links their teachable moment, their symptom mm -hmm. to a particular to, to a particular piece of evidence that can challenge them. Mm -hmm. 
And once they're challenged by that, I can think of a positive way of, of changing that. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to do this with examples. And this is the hard thing with how we do this in practice. But when we do this in practice, there isn't a generic thing. This is intuitive, but there are sort of standard things that I'd often use. So say somebody is overweight and we're worried about obesity, okay? Or we're worried about diabetes or somebody. So a lot of people, they'd be worried about obesity and we can link that to diabetes. Uh, with diabetes, I'll often say, oh, do you know that a big study, 250,000 people, in Europe, and they looked at the food association with disease. And do you know what is the number one food that was associated with causing diabetes? And I usually say it like that, really positive, mm. because I make it very obvious. And I've done this with groups of doctors, and they all say, oh, it's sugar. Yeah. I go, no, it's processed meat. Processed meat, yeah. And then they go, huh? Mm. And then I explain what processed meat is because you need it to be the actual foods they buy, not some technical term. So I say, that's, is that, that's sausage and bacon and ham. And would you ever have a ham sandwich? Personalizing it to them. Mm. Okay, so I've got a bit of information with a bit of a shock factor. Mm. Because once I shock them, I have made their unconscious food choices very conscious. Mm. Okay, so. The information is bringing it, highlighting it, that they're in charge of their health through their food choice. Mm -hmm. Because that's uncomfortable, and I might have ruined their lunch for the rest of the year, mm -hmm. I'll then say, do you know what's really good for diabetes? Mm -hmm. Or for weight loss, whatever way I want to play this. So very good for diabetes, I'll say, we know the whole grains, mm -hmm. we know the beans, and beans is one I'll often choose because I know Irish people are really low in beans. Mm. So I know I can guarantee they're not getting enough beans so I can always use beans. Mm. And that's the nice thing about knowing your population. Mm. And I can go in and I can say that beans can uh, lower your birth weight, can uh, no, lower, lower your body weight, mm. or, it can, or I could go into, I usually try and give an explanation. So instead of just saying beans are good for you, I'll say, do you know what beans do? Beans are full of fiber. Most people think fiber is only in brown bread, mm. but beans are full of fiber and fiber can bulk up your tummy. And if you bulk up your tummy, you don't eat as much, so you drop weight. Mm. So that's one way I could talk about it. Or I could say, well, fiber feeds your bugs in your gut. I don't know if you've ever heard about the bugs in your gut. We call it the microbiome. There's more of them than there is of us. And each one eats a different fiber. And if we can get more varieties of fiber, we improve health. The association through the American Gut Project has seen that the more types of fiber you have in your diet, the, more, the better health outcomes. So I'll usually give an explanation and then I'll put it to them and I'll say, would you ever have beans? Mm -hmm. could, could you put beans in your spaghetti bolognese? Have you ever tried hummus? So I'll try and physically see where they're having it. Mm -hmm. And then the quickest way to assess dietary pattern, which is what it's all about. There isn't one diet, there's a dietary pattern. So in terms of the dietary pattern, I usually say, what do you have for breakfast? Because I know there is a standard, it usually our default meals, what we have all the time the same, is the easiest thing to challenge because if I can change that and improve it and it becomes the new default that's a huge win mm -hmm. so if I can say okay your default breakfast is a fry of sausages and bacon and eggs or it's some refined cereal we have cocoa pops which is chocolate covered rice krispies yeah. uh, I can raise their game Mm -hmm. So if we can improve that and say, can you get a whole grain oat? Mm -hmm. Can you get nuts? Could you get some fresh fruit? And even we can raise that game and say, could we get some cinnamon and allspice? And we, we can always add in something in there that's going to be a little bit better. I had a patient today who came in whose breakfast was just brilliant. Mm -hmm. He had 
he was one of these guys who's he's 69, but he looked, I don't know, 45. Mm -hmm. And he does, he works out and all. And I said, what's your breakfast? And he said, well, I juice maybe three or four of your fruits and a cold press juicer and celery and spinach. And then I have some organic cornflakes with some oat milk. And I was like, cool, mm -hmm. really good. Yeah. Uh, but he was concerned about aging. Mm, okay. So I talked about calorie restriction being probably the best way mm. to stop aging and calorie restriction. Sometimes eating more plant-based is a good way to naturally restrict the amount of nutrients. Yeah. Uh, and I sort of, although his breakfast was brilliant, I said, have you ever tried spices on your breakfast? Mm. So it was just notching it up a level. Mm -hmm. Or could you try herbs or seeds on top of your meals? So it's just remembering that there's always something we can do to enhance it. Yeah. So it's really reduce something, replace with something else that's positive, and then the dietary pattern reflected in one meal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very quickly, it could be uh, it could be that you say, and usually I'll associate it with saturated fat or meat mm -hmm. or dairy. Mm -hmm. So say prostate cancer, I'm worried about prostate cancer. Can I, can I get my PSA testing? Mm -hmm. And I'll say, oh, PSA, you, what are you worried about? Mm -hmm. prostate oh, you're very worried about prostate cancer. Do you have a family history? And then I'll say, oh, okay. The, there is associations of certain ways of eating on prostate cancer. And I might say, do you know this? I'll sometimes give them a, a a fact that Esselstein often uses, Caldwell Esselstein, he'll say, in 1958, there was 10,000 cases of prostate cancer in the US. Mm. And in the same year, there was 18 cases in Japan. Mm. And you go, hmm, why is the difference? Because when the Japanese move to the States within two generations, they get up to the similar level. Mm. They don't reach the same level and they're not sure if that's the cultural association with seaweed or tofu. Or, but there must be an environmental. So I'm selling the fact, buying them in. There must be an environmental reason. And then I might talk about dairy mm. and say we, we're suspicious of dairy because dairy's purpose is probably to grow a calf. A calf doubles its birth weight in six weeks. And now a human, and it's with the only food we know that is perfectly made for humans, doubles its birth weight in six months. So... I'll make an association and then I will say, what could you use? Could you try oat milk? Have you ever tried oat milk in coffee? It's got really trendy. It's in all the coffee shops now. So, so I'll talk through it that way. So that's the reduce, replace, and then I'll usually start with breakfast. If I've done breakfast, I might move on to lunch because lunch is usually a default sandwich and the sandwich is usually ham or cheese. And hammer cheese, I'd say, could you try seedy bread? Because I'm not, it's not that I want them to eat a certain way. I just want to improve what they're doing. Yeah. So seedy bread is better than a white baguette. Mm. Could they have lettuce and tomato? So we're just raising the game in terms of nutritional quantity. And then I might say, have you ever tried swapping your cheese for sun-dried tomatoes and hummus? Mm. I, John, this is this is uh, just priceless information, and and your your experience shines through there as well. With you know, I'm, I'm talking to patients and really making this easily accessible, right? I mean, everyone is at a different point uh, with when it comes to their health in general, when it comes to nutrition specifically. So I think you know, finding these teachable moments that's also something that I really took away from your from your presentation um, at, at, at Nutrition Greater Medicine, and now again as well, these teachable moments, finding them and really you know, figuring out what people are worried about in that situation, as for example, they do in motivational interviewing as well, just asking their question, what, what, what are you worried about? Not just being focused on the symptoms that the patient might have, you know, you, you, you touch on that high blood sugar, maybe some people aren't even that interested that their blood sugar is high. And the same with blood pressure, we know that, right? People might even feel better with, with a higher blood pressure. So, but when you find out what they're really worried about, then that's something where that you can use. And I, I think these finding, being aware of these teachable moments in the first place, that's just something, uh, something incredibly valuable. And then what you, uh, what you, what you touched on there as well, not just telling them what to, what not to eat, 
but giving alternatives of what to eat and asking these questions. I think the the the, uh, the style that you've now talked about, the way you do it with your patients, uh, is something that really everyone can do, even if you just have a couple of minutes. Maybe if you are also if you're a specialist, I think this is possible to ask these ask these key questions. Um, you know, to figure out where people are at and not just, you know, as you said, not just, um, you know, push that, push the information down their throat because people are very resistant to change when you, mm. when you, when you, they feel it's, it's very intuitive. People feel when you, when you want them to change and yeah. it causes resistance. Um, and I think the, the way you have now, uh, the, the way you have described and the way that you do it with your patients is just a way that doesn't, I, I think, I mean, maybe you have some people who, who um, you know, who um, have resistance to that as well, but I think it's very unlikely to cause resistance because you're so close to their, to, to their reality, to the way that they experience life. And like, I suppose that there's a few things I'm thinking of there. Yeah. Uh, one is that I haven't thought of before, which is sometimes I create the teachable moment mm -hmm. because I see that they're too unconcerned the point you made yeah, yeah so i had a patient yesterday whose blood pressure was 160 over 100 and he doesn't want to come in and get his blood pressure checked and yeah. he hasn't really taken his medication so i gave him a whole load of alternative options have you tried mindfulness meditation have you tried exercise can we increase linseeds and hibiscus tea and we, we, we did loads of changes and uh when I saw him yesterday, his blood pressure was, wasn't great. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not convinced about his compliance. So my teachable moment was, I'm going to push you into concern. Okay. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll do this with, with smokers. I'll say, okay, so you're not ready to stop smoking. Okay. But then, no, that's okay. If you don't want to stop smoking, that's okay. But and if you got lung cancer, would you be ready to stop smoking? And they go, yeah, yeah. And I go, oh, so, so we'll wait. Mm. So the same way that I do with blood pressure, blood pressure is often asymptomatic. Mm. So I say, yeah, I know your blood pressure is high and we know this is associated with stroke. Uh, and this is a little bit bad, but I paint a picture. Mm. So if you couldn't use the left side of your body and you're in a wheelchair and your wife had to pull you around, push you around that you'd probably be motivated to look after your blood pressure and they go yeah and i go okay and i sit with that to see if a little light goes on in their head going ah oh, maybe i shouldn't wait until i can't move mm -hmm. so sometimes i will if somebody seems so stuck in their ways mm -hmm. i will push them into the scenario of the disease that is very motivating yeah. Okay, so sometimes I do that. Yeah. And the other thing, sometimes, sometimes I'll see there's resistance. And I don't care what you change, but I'd like something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I had one guy who came in to see me and he says, uh, Dr. Alman, I wasn't going to come back and see you because. Uh, you told me that I shouldn't eat meat and my whole family are rugby players and they've always mm -hmm. eaten meat. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, so you're eating your greens. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to say there was one part of the message that you heard you were uncomfortable with, but there was another part of the message that you didn't hear. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I will say, have you tried meditating three minutes? Mm -hmm. Can you do some movement first thing in the morning? Because we know it releases myokines which are like hope chemicals and boost your self-esteem and i'll give an angle on something because once we make one change and we feel better in ourselves mm -hmm. then we're ready for change number two mm -hmm. so it's to remember to push the door that's easy to open mm -hmm. and usually the one that's easy to open is linked to their problem mm -hmm. but sometimes it can be a totally different one because once we start feeling better, it's probably what happens with the placebo mm. or with anybody going on a diet, they feel better because mm -hmm. you're starting to take control of your life. You're starting to feel empowered. You're starting to feel, I can do this. And once you feel I can do this, I can do more. Mm -hmm. So it's really just jumping on any bit of lifestyle because once you move one thing and you feel better and because the doctor 
There's the other big important point, and it's probably why I feel this is so important in general practice, is when you're in community and you're following up with patients that you've seen through thick and thin, you know which patient has had the affair with the bank manager. You know how distressed the family was that Mary failed French in her final exams. And you know that for the rest of your life. Mm. You know that they thought they'd cancer, but it wasn't cancer. So you've got this whole history. And they know that they were able to turn to you. You don't remember that they turned to you. But they know that Dr. Allman was there at that moment. Mm. So we forget that that connection and that long-term relationship and that trust means that if I say, can you brush your teeth standing on one leg? They'll try it. I need to have a good reason why I say yeah, that. That's yeah. a stupid one, but yeah. there is that power that we can suggest things and we don't realize how powerful it is. So the, the other day I walked down the road and I saw, I was walking with a friend and the patient said hello to the friend and then went, oh, Dr. Allman. Mm. And we're all the same age. Mm -hmm. We all live in the same area. Mm. But when she came to see me a few days later, she said, when I saw you the other day, Dr. Allman, I thought you were a celebrity. Okay. And what she was really saying was, I saw you out of context, but knew you were someone important to my life. Mm. And that's what doctors don't realize, mm. is the importance of our role gives us a power that we underestimate to nudge people mm. into a behavior change, whether that's nutrition or lifestyle or purpose, whatever. That's probably the important thing that doctors really understand. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's, that's a really, really, um, I think that's a story that's reflective of a lot of doctors realities without realizing it right i mean we had we had this um one person one presenter one um guest at vegmet also said that i think firefighters are the most trusted people in our societies at least here in western europe and um but the second ones are doctors right so the, this power that we hold that you've just talked about i think this is something that also sh i think it would be very helpful if that was in our awareness a bit more you know realizing that I've talked to people about nutrition. You know, now I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a final year medical student, close to close to finally finishing medical school, and I've talked to people over the course of, the, of these years uh, when I was in medical school, of being in medical school, and I've asked them about nutrition, or what they know about it, what they think about it, whether they think it's important. And sometimes people will tell me things that I've never heard about, and I'll ask them where they where they got this from, and they tell me, well, I heard this 10 years ago from a general practitioner. Who might not even be in practice any longer I, I, like this is literally what i heard once it was 10 years ago from a person who doesn't work as a doctor any longer so that was just striking to me understanding you know this stays in people's heads for so long and understandable you know you see doctors rarely or you know you don't see them daily at least or hopefully not daily um and so when you see them and you have to sometimes wait for a long time so they're special people medical doctors are special people to most in most people's lives so yeah they listen and and, and they'll do it so i think understanding that our work, you know, as medical students and medical doctors is powerful and we can actually help people put people on a better trajectory and also doing it in the way that you've described incrementally, um, you know, um, you know, con continuously doing this. I think this really changes can change people's minds in their lives. Yeah. Um, so, uh, John, I would like to get into another topic. Let's switch gears here and let's talk about planetary health. I know that's something that you are that's close to my heart, that's also close to your heart. And uh, I know that you, uh, you've put together a toolkit for Wonka, the, the, um, uh, which is the World Organization for Family Practitioners, right? And I've got, I found a really interesting statement that I just want to share with you. It's just two sentences. Um, it's from May 2017. As family, family doctors, we are in a unique position to promote knowledge about planetary health and behavior changes, which can improve both individual and planetary health. The so-called co-benefits, such as active transportation, low emission sources of energy, and a more vegetable-based diet in our patients' communities. It is also imperative that planetary health be included in the core curriculum of medical schools, family medicine residencies, and further professional, professional development. We must strive to integrate sustainability into our individual behavior, clinical practice, and in our meetings. And that's from, from May 2017, right? That's almost four years ago. And I know that we're on, on a good trajectory here. I know that we're working towards this, but I know that you also have have interesting and 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 helpful ideas on how we can maybe improve this and how we can maybe make this more accessible for general practitioners. So I'd be really interested to hear uh, what, what your thoughts are there and what you what you're working on in this um, in this context. 
Yeah, no, it's a fascinating area and it's probably what's taken up more of my time more recently. And what's interesting is I sort of slipped into this by default. So we had arranged a, a conference uh, with Plant Based Doctors Ireland, the first conference in Dublin. And mm, a few weeks before, Eat Lancet came out. Mm -hmm. So the Eat Lancet report was the connection between how are we going to eat to save the planet and save the people in 2050 when there's going to be about 10 billion of us so that made me say gee this is so close this planetary health connection is phenomenally close so another member of plant-based doctors ireland sean owens who also spoke in the webinar yeah. he he took this on board and he went to the irish college of gps and managed to get a speaking point at their conference and he put forward an, uh, an agenda to have this taken on by the college at the AGM. But he was a trainee, so he phoned me on the day that he was meant to present this and told me I had to do it because he wasn't allowed to. Uh -huh. okay. So here on me with my lovely family outing on a Saturday, I had to jump and go off to the AGM, stand up in front of 300 GPs and explain about planetary health. So I became the public voice of planetary health by default. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I was contacted by somebody I knew who said, could I work on a education module? two hours long for GPs in Ireland. They do this continuous medical education where they get these little workshops and they work on a topic. And I had to work on planetary health. Mm -hmm. So myself and Sean Owens worked on this topic and presented it. And I ended up having to present to all the tutors in Ireland a 30 minute summary of planetary health. So I had to learn so much. I was here suddenly becoming an expert in planetary health when I was just a GP. Uh, and by studying that up, I realized, wow, there's so much we can do. Mm. And by the time I, I remember finishing the talk, and one guy came up who's quite prominent in general practice in Ireland, and he came up to me and he says, I was cynical for the first half year talk. Mm. I wasn't buying it at all, mm. but I got the message by the end. Mm -hmm. And that was very powerful for me, mm. the fact that this could resonate with people, because it's amazing, doctors, we're so cynical. We sit there in meetings and we go, well, what's the story? Is the x-axis the same as the y-axis? And how long was the study for? And we're there trying to prove things wrong. Mm -hmm. So to have people come back and feedback that this was powerful was, was important. So from that, we decided we needed to talk to the Irish College of General Practitioners. And we were told to do that, we need an infographic. So we need an A4 colorful page summarizing planetary health. Okay. So here was me looking at these textbooks on planetary health and the complexity of system change and all these different specialties. Having to put it into a two hour workshop was tough. Having to put that into a 30 minute presentation was tough as well. But now I had to put it into a one page A4 to summarize the whole of planetary health <laughs> for GPs. Yeah. So, so what we did work out was there's two areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's what you do in patient care and there's what you do in your practice. Mm -hmm. So very simplistic. In terms of patient care, we need to know that healthcare has a big emissions uh, connection and that like over 4% of global emissions mm -hmm. is due to healthcare. Healthcare without harm have worked out that if, if healthcare was a country, it'd be the fifth largest emission producer in the world. So mm. although we say do no harm, yeah. we're adding to the problem. So we need to acknowledge that. Mm. The number one thing I usually say is the Lancet has said that climate change is the biggest health crisis of the 21st century. Mm. And they said that in 2009. In 2015, they said it is the biggest health crisis and opportunity of mm. the 21st century. So we're trying to get it more into like, we can do this mm. instead of just scaring the wits out of us. Let's try and make it positive. Yeah. And then to know that there's that issue and learning about the science, learning that healthcare has its own emissions. And then if we look at primary care, which is where I'm focusing, I'm trying to sell this to doctors because mm -hmm. they can't see any connection. In patient care, we know that most emissions is due to medications, mm -hmm. okay? Across the board in healthcare emissions is really high. In primary care, it's between 60 and 90% because mm 
because most of the prescribing often comes from primary care. It'll be started in the hospital, but then we take responsibility. Mm -hmm. And in terms of that, you need to understand that you might have a raw material that's found in the Amazon and transferred to China, where it's made into a product that goes to India and is produced into a medication that's transported to Ireland, because Ireland is a big source for pharmaceutical companies, and then it's packaged, and then we transport it all around the place. Mm -hmm. That was a long journey. And then there's the pollution effect of that medication when it gets into the system, when we throw antibiotics that are unfinished down the toilet and they're in the water system. So medication is huge. So there is medication, referrals, and lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. So medications, we're great at starting medications, we're not good at stopping. Mm -hmm. Okay? We'd nearly prefer that the person dies of the medication we start and they die and I hadn't given a medication because mm -hmm. at least I try. Yeah. The, the issue with medications is like, uh, you're depressed, so I'll give you an antidepressant. But don't stop it because it might come back. You've got acid reflux. Oh, let's try a proton pump inhibitor, but just keep taking it just in case, all this just in case. Yeah. So we need to get the confidence yeah. to stop medication. So we need to be really judicious with how we prescribe. We need to understand that, say, inhalers is a big, it's probably the biggest group. And inhalers, the we forget that the gas that's in an MDI, meter dose inhaler, has over a thousand times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. Mm, okay. So we need to move to dry powder inhalers. Mm -hmm. And the GINA guidelines in 2020 said we shouldn't be using the MDI is in isolation. You need to be on steroids and they're just emergency. So that's something that GPs understand because it's they're fully responsible for the carbon footprint of the medication they choose when they have a reliable alternative. Mm -hmm. So we're working on a toolkit for that alone. We've got a toolkit for inhalers that we've been working on for six months. And I could talk to you for 20 mm -hmm. minutes about inhalers. Yeah. So that's prescribed. Mm -hmm. Referrals. Mm -hmm. So we'd often say that the general practitioner is the gatekeeper. You access secondary care or tertiary care through the GP. It's not the same in every country, but in, in Ireland, the GP is the first port of call. Mm -hmm. So if you want a test to see a specialist, you have to go through the GP. Mm -hmm. And in modern healthcare, I'm just worried, doc. I just want a scan of my back to see what's wrong. Mm. And you're like, well, you've no clinical indication. Yeah, mm. but it's free in my insurance doc. Yeah. And you're going, yeah, but when we do the scan and we find out you've got an incidental cyst in your kidneys and have to follow that up in six months with another to make sure that that's not growing or biopsy it and end up leading to a bleed in your back. And we underestimate the risks. Can I have a colonoscopy doctor? Cause I'm just worried about colon cancer. And you go, well, one in 200 develop complications. Mm. I didn't know that. Mm. So we allow screening for tests without understanding the downsides of screening. Mm. We allow access to tests to allay fears. You've had a headache for ages. Could it be a brain tumor? What's the best way to find out? You have to get a brain scan. Mm. No, you don't. You know what I mean? So we're just, we're caught into this difficulty where we're trying to appease and keep the patient happy. And we're not well trained enough to challenge them. We don't have the, we don't see the downsides of all that secondary care referrals. Mm. So what's the solution? Aha, uh -huh. this is what you're waiting for. The solution is we have a disease care system. Mm -hmm. I am trained in disease care, not healthcare. Mm. I will see you when you have your disease. Don't come to me earlier because I have no idea what to do with you. But when you come with your disease, I'll be able to give you some medications and procedures that can slow the progression. It's like breaks. It'll keep getting worse, but we'll slow it down because the solution is upstream. Yeah. The solution is we know that 40 to 90% of, depending on the condition, from cancer through to diabetes is caused by lifestyle. And I'd love to be a wellness doctor. I'd love to encourage wellness. So if we can see that the lifestyle changes, if we had a paradigm shift, which is what we need for planetary health, 
to decrease the consumption and overpopulation that's causing the problem. We need the same in healthcare, where we move from disease care, which doesn't work anymore because they're diseases of affluence and diseases of consumption. We need to move upstream to learn to live differently. Yeah. And we need doctors that teach them how to eat better, move better, feel connected with others. Because modern society, we're all disconnected and lonely and eaten wrong and alcohol to, to numb that discomfort. Mm. And we need to, uh, we need them to have more purpose. We need to have this motivation that people have a reason to live because we're just carrying along stuff in our faces, distracted by our phones, is on conveyor belts. So the decrease in the prescribing and the referrals, mm. the solution is lifestyle. And the lifestyle is moving upstream and it matches. Yeah. That's the first half of the toolkit. And then the second is, what you can do as a role model in your practice mm. to motivate your team, to increase the team spirit, to show society that we can become a green practice, that we are conscious of this, so that they start seeing the example as somebody who stands up as a, uh, an example in the community, a role model, we can advocate for that. It's not that you sit down with a patient and go, do you know that the planet is in trouble and I want you to look after the planet? It's more that the connection is through lifestyle as well as how you show what you do in your practice. Yeah. Everybody in my community knows if you've got an electric car or not. They know what the GP is driving or if he cycles to work. Mm -hmm. So there is that aspect that you can lead by example. Yeah. This is really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself here, but this is really invaluable information, John. I think the um, leading by example, I mean, everything you've just said, this is really interesting to me, to me as well to hear this so condensed from you. Um, yeah, moving upstream. I recently had a conversation with with a with a nutritional scientist uh, who we, we talked about the the origin of the word radical. Right, it's radix. It's it's the root. So we have to take we have to be radical in a sense and not radical as we use the word usually, but radical as we you know work at the root cause of something. As you said, uh, moving upstream and really trying to to uh, you know trying to prevent the problem before it happens. You know, really preventive medicine, lifestyle medicine. Um, and it's really interesting to hear about the, the um, you know, the emissions that come from, from uh, referrals and that come from medicine, uh, from, you know, pres from prescriptions as well. Um, this is something that we can, that we can change. This, I think this is something where maybe also medical schools should go back a bit more to learning more about clinical symptoms and to being able to really assess whether something is necessary to be checked by an MRI, for example, or by CT, or whether you, okay, from your, from your clinical symptoms, I can already know that this is not a brain tumor, or it's very unlikely. And then also do a risk, risk assessment, right? Risk benefit assessment and see, okay, is the, is the benefit really that big uh, when, I do, when, I, when, I, when I actually prescribe a referral, uh, referral here, or can I do this in my general practice? Um, John, there's, I, I don't want to. I don't want to keep you for so long. I know you are in your practice right now, and I know that you have patients to work with. Do you have another, let's say, five minutes to talk about to talk about Plant Based Doctors Ireland? Okay. <laughs> if you... the, the one point I would say there is that my okay. feeling, whether it's planetary health or whether it's lifestyle medicine or whether it's nutrition, the hardest thing is to get it into the curriculum. Mm. Uh, and, and, and probably where I feel it, it needs to be is probably in general practice. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be in the general practice part of the curriculum because I think it is doctors in the community that see patients when they're not sick. They see them for well person checks or for filling in a form that have the potential to get in there and alter lifestyle. And they have the strong connection so they've got that added power of knowing someone for years and being in a trusted position. So it's probably within the primary care, the community care part of the medical school curriculum that it needs to go in. And it probably needs to go in as planetary health because the solution is lifestyle. Yeah. So it, I don't think we've thought that through. We, we sort of say to curriculum developers, oh, you need planetary health in there. Yeah. You need to say, Planetary health for me is a lifestyle medicine. It's the solution. So, and, and I think the only people willing to or being able to or in the power to do it is the community care position. Yeah. So it's, it's something we need to work on because uh, it's one thing to say we need it in there. It's a little bit like saying, I want you all to eat a whole food plant-based diet. Mm, that doesn't work. You need to say where it fits and how it fits and make it relevant.
Yeah. Okay. And thanks, Dr. Sarland. No worries. So yeah, I mean, if, if you have the time, I really don't. I mean, this is just. Um, I, I just think it's it's um, incredible work that you're doing, and I think it's to me it's super empowering to see that there that there are different uh, communities or different different organizations, you know, popping up popping up all over the place and in Ireland as well. So if you just want to share some uh, some some of the work that you do with plant based doctors, Ireland, how people can connect with you as well. I think that would be super valuable. So Plant Based Doctors Ireland was created maybe three or four years ago. Uh, and it was just a group of people. It was a group of mainly doctors, mainly GPs. It was really GPs, dietitian. Uh, and there might have been about four or five of us that became 10, 12. Uh, and we set up the first. We, what it was, was we, as we set up Plant Based Healthcare Professionals UK set up just after us. Mm. And they invited us over to speak at their conferences. Mm. So about three of us went over and spoke at two of their conferences. And then we invited them over to speak at our conference. And our role is, I would see our role as educating doctors more than the public. Because I found when I did those talks, I was talking mainly to vegans mm. okay. who all said, yes, sir. And they loved hearing it. And, but it was an echo chamber. And I said, this isn't a good use of my time. Do you know what I mean? What I do with my patients is objective and it's sensible, but it's not pushing anything. It's just encouraging. So I prefer to talk to people who will gain rather than people that love to hear the message. So I realized that we needed to talk more to, to doctors. So we started talking to GP training groups. We started talking to uh, this continuous medical education groups. And Zoom has been great because we've been able to do talks in different parts of the country quite quickly and mm. I gave one last week to a group down southwest of the country so it would have been a five-hour drive to go down to it yeah. and the I asked them for feedback for us and one of the feedback was uh, it's now several days after the talk and it was just on plant-based nutrition the talk I gave mm. uh, they said and we're all still talking about it mm. and it was lovely to hear that resonating with people who did not choose to have that talk they had to go by obligation. Mm. So you're not talking to people who are already interested. Mm. But the fact that they're talking several days later shows there's an appetite. So we've had two conferences. We've probably moved a little bit into planetary health. So a lot of the doctors who were in plant-based doctors, Ireland have moved into planetary health and are working with the Irish College of General Practitioners and Irish Doctors for the Environment. Uh, and they're all doing lifestyle medicine diplomas. So it's all just connected and it's all moving the same sort of way. Yeah. It's amazing how it has all come together in that sense. Uh, and we to contact us is through plantbaseddoctorsireland at gmail.com. So plantbaseddoctorsireland website. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're sort of working on resources, but the resources are becoming resources for lifestyle medicine and resources for planetary health. Mm -hmm. more than specifically plant-based doctors ireland it's sort of it's all broadening yeah okay and the same at the same yeah. time and do you, do you have social media contacts as well can people hook up on social media absolutely none absolutely none okay i see absolutely i'm my priorities to my patients okay and i work nine sessions a week so i get a half day and finish about three o'clock and between that and my family yeah i would be scared that social media would preoccupy me yeah. and would be more enticing than my three beautiful daughters so i'm going to keep them as a priority at the moment uh, that that's good to hear i'm actually i'm actually similar uh, to, to you in that regard i don't have three daughters but i try to stay uh, until now i've tried to stay away from social media as much as i can <laughs> yeah. it's also it's also because it'll keep me humble hmm. okay because if you get a lot of positive feedback on social media you're suddenly amazing well, I'm only as good as my last patient, mm. which keeps me grounded. Mm. Social media can be an artificial presentation of oneself and looking for that recognition. So I'm trying to keep myself grounded. Well, John, it's, it's, um, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And thank you so much for your time. I know you're in your practice and I know that uh, time is always of the essence. So really uh, fr fr from, from my heart, thank you so much for, for taking the time uh, this information is, I, as I said, I think it's so valuable to to all health professionals, really. And um, 
I think that people will be able to take a lot away from from your from your presentation, from your talk, Sweet. from from what well, you. It's a it's a pleasure for me, and that I'm really impressed with what Pan are doing. Mm. And the interesting thing for me with Pan is that by having to present in the webinar, I had to think about what I do do, mm. because most of us are not aware of what I do. It's in sort of unconscious knowledge because it's automatic. So by having to write down or think it through. I managed to see what I actually do. So right. thank you for that. <laughs> if, if, that could, if that was of any service, I, I wasn't any part of that, but if Pam was of any service for that, I'm, I'm very grateful to hear that as well. So thanks, Super. thank you so much, John. And um, I, hope to, I hope to talk to you soon and I hope to maybe see you soon as well once the, once the pandemic maybe is over, once we're all, uh, once we're all vaccinated um, and we, then we can get to see each other as well. Hopefully. Great. Thank you. Thank Pleasure. You. Now, I had a really good time speaking to John and I hope that you had a good time listening to our conversation as well. I just think that John has so much experience and knowledge to share, both as a general practitioner and as a human being as well. And he's able to share that in such a way that is easy to understand and really engaging. If you like this conversation and if you would like to learn more about John's work, make sure to check out plantbaseddoctorsireland.com. And if you're interested in learning more about nutrition in general from our side, make sure to check out our website at pan-int.org and make sure to follow us on our social media profiles as well. I hope to see you in the next episode and I wish you all the best.